Hello and welcome to GMBN Tech. This week, we are focusing this ask on Adventure Week and a lot of bike packing. So we reached out to you guys on Instagram and got plenty of great questions for me to answer in this show. So the first question is from the Skya Guinaldo. I hope I got that right. What a beautiful name. And um, they say, what is the typical bike packing setup? Um, I think when you look at kind of more typical or more kind of classic bike packing that's maybe done on the road or on the gravel, they have a lot more fitment options. I don't know if there is a true typical setup in mountain biking, and that's for kind of a couple of different reasons. First of all, if you've got a full suspension bike, you would you probably could be really limiting the way you can fit equipment in the front triangle. Secondly, if you want to drop a post and on a rear suspension bike, it, the problem is twofold because not only do you have the issue of, you know, not being able to perhaps move the saddle up and down because of the saddlebag, but also the rear wheel will come into its travel. So what typical means for a mountain bike really, really varies. I think there are a couple of great options. So you've got handlebar bags, which are great for storing things that you tend to kind of sleep with because it's quite an e like an elongated um, tube. Um, then you've got things like frame bags, which will work for some. You've also got saddle bags, like I mentioned, but that often works better with a, a fixed seat post. Although you, you can get some that probably won't damage your dropper, but they'll probably nullify it in its use. And, um, and of course, a backpack. Now, a backpack is actually probably, for some people, a really great way to get into bike packing. And although it is, you know, we're going to talk about some different ways of packing your equipment, etc., and carrying it, there is no reason why a backpack might not work for you. Well, there's no reason why it wouldn't work for you. And also provide a really good way just to try it out and see if you like it. So um, those are some of the options. Like I said, as typical goes, it's probably hard to pin it down to one thing. The next question is from Kartik Bishnoi, and they say, how to recover overnight? Well, um, I think that when, when people are doing long rides or, or you know, I think I, I actually sometimes find myself doing this accidentally day to day when you kind of, you don't really keep much of an eye on how much caffeine you're taking, how much coffee you're drinking, whatever. And what that means is that you get tired. So you drink a coffee maybe late in the afternoon than you know you should. And then you subsequently have an appalling night's sleep. And so the next day you find yourself really tired and you say, hell's teeth, I'll have another coffee. And it just is a vicious cycle that repeats. So for me, the best way to recover overnight is to firstly ensure I'm having a good night's sleep. Because and I can only attest to my personal experience, but I'd say, you know, even if I'm really tired, like, you know, exhausted, dehydrated, desperate for sleep, with the appropriate amount of caffeine, I will struggle to sleep. So you've got to give your body your best chance. And I would say, don't always go for um, a pep of energy because it could, you know, really affect the next day's riding. Secondly, I'd say, um, you know, when I'm riding, I don't compromise on what I want to eat. My, that's my kind of rule to myself. I'll go out and I'll, you know, accept all the miles readily, but I'm allowed to eat whatever I want. So I kind of eat like, you know, Elizabethan royalty. I just go absolutely mad. And that means that my body certainly isn't, you know, looking for the calories or anything like that. It's, it's, it's all taken care of. The third thing I talk about in terms of recovery it's when you're thinking about bikepacking, it's of course a balancing act between essentially comfort and how much stuff you're going to take with you because you can't take, you know, your sauna and your, um, you know, four post a bed. It doesn't work like that. But some people are lighter sleepers than others. So you might find that it's okay for some people just to, you know, sleep in a, um, sleep in a bin bag by the side of the road. You, on the other hand, might need a bit more comfort because if you're not getting good sleep, it's really going to, you know, deplete the enjoyment of the experience. So I would say that's really worth, you know, thinking about really. Um, the next question is from Josh Singleton. And he says, what kit do you need for multi-day bike packing? So this is the kit that I would take with me, um, you know, without compromise. And um, yeah, absolutely, I would consider this needed. First of all, waterproof jacket. That's a, a really big one. Um, a battery pack, so one of those kind of charger, packs, um, some money, a bivy sack. Now what's a bivy sack? So a bivy sack is kind of like a, um, a poleless tent. 
I joked earlier on and said the bin bag. It's essentially just a really nice bin bag that you crawl into and you just, um, it's like a bigger sleeping bag. So you get in your sleeping bag, then you get in your bivy sack, and then you've got a little drawstring to close to close off the top. Um, it's not very luxurious, but it is very light. Um, then of course you've got a sleeping bag. I would say if you can get a liner as well, a silk liner, not only are they very lightweight and relatively inexpensive, but it could really, really increase your comfort. And I've actually had to use it once, pretty grim, I was um, I actually rode to Fort William a couple of years ago because the rider I was working with wanted to do some testing. So I thought I couldn't be bothered to drive. So I thought I may as well enjoy the ride. And I had a couple of days of it. But as I got into Scotland on the um, on the west coast, you just get eaten alive by midges. So I had this uh, had this silk liner that had been I'd actually just got another bike packing trip a couple of weeks earlier, and I hadn't washed it. I'm ashamed to say, and it was pretty pretty keen. The smell of it was sharp. And I was just getting eaten alive by midges. And so I drew my drawstring and my bivy sack to almost a close and I woke up almost asphyxiating because there was no oxygen left in this bloody bivy sack. So I opened up, oh my God, like then just like inhaling midges and it was awful. So what I ended up doing was, and it looked quite bizarre, I put my silk sleeping bag liner over me, so like my feet were just sticking at the bottom, and then I got in the tent, and it smelled awful, and I could only just about see, but the midges abated, so it, it was worth it. But <laughs> and um, so that's just a bit of a you know my uh, emotional retelling of an encounter with a, um, a sleeping bag liner. And the last thing I'd say you really really need is a dry bag somewhere you can put your electric things, knowing they're not going. To get damaged. Along the way, things like sun cream, etc., or even bug repellent in that case, are very useful. Um, consumable things like that aren't necessarily something though that is difficult to pick up along the way. So it depends if you're going really out into the wilderness or just kind of, you know, going along a kind of uh, relatively beaten path. Um, if it's the latter, you tend to be able to correct your errors along the way. But I would say, yeah, jacket, battery pack, money, bivy sack, sleeping bag and a liner are very much needed. Um, Andrew has got a question, and before we smirk at this, I think this is actually a genuine concern a lot of people have, at least if we go off how many people asked this question. Um, I'm assuming it's not um, just, you know, a uh, bit of sarcasm. I think this is a genuine inquiry. And Andrew just says, poo, what do? Which, um, I mean, you know, it's a very uh, compelling and, uh, Know, weighty discussion this one so let's get into it um i definitely would say just plan ahead you know go for a nice breakfast in the morning and make use of the facilities because if you're going into nowhere you will be going into nowhere but um at the very least if you are somebody that could be um perhaps vulnerable to um being caught a mile from home sort of thing maybe just take take some uh, take some blue roll for the ride um but yes, I don't condone pooing in the woods by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and um, next question is from George. And they say, after a long time of riding, how do you stop your bum from becoming sore? And this is really important. Um, comfort is vital. Um, I, I, I've probably got slightly different feeling to some people on this. My argument would be, if I was to run a marathon tomorrow, and then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day, me not being a runner, even if I had a really well-fitting pair of shoes and some high-tech socks, my feet are still gonna get painful. And I think, to be honest, sometimes as cyclists, we, we, we kind of forget that there's a human element of some flesh and bone underneath all this high-tech clothing and saddles, etc. Ultimately, sometimes you are just going to get saddle sore, and that's just something you've got to put up with. Um, you know, try and, uh, I think if it's, things like paracetamol do work really well. Um, and honestly, if it's, uh, if it gets really bad, then, you know, I've, I once had a saddle sore the size of a golf ball and it turned my leg gray down to about the size of my knee. That was a horrible experience. It shouldn't get that bad. I would say that it, there are different kinds of discomfort. If you find there's a lot of pressure on your bones, on your actual sit bones, then that's just kind of bruising and that's just kind of suck it up really, in, in my experience anyway. If your skin is very sore, and that can also happen simultaneously, things like Sudocrim are really, really good. They're kind of thing you put on like, um, you know, nappy rash and stuff, and they're gonna enable their skin to heal and um, 
that can actually make a large amount of difference. Um, but yeah, there, there is an element of it if you aren't somebody that's used to putting in lots of miles. It's like the marathon thing, you know, your, your feet are going to hurt and your, your backside is going to hurt if you throw yourself in at the deep end. Um, but if you're doing a multi-day thing, often the first couple of days can be the worst in general. You know, after th two or three days, you think, I can't do this. This is absolutely horrific. But you find yourself riding into it. I know lots of people that have kind of road cycled Land's End to John and Groats over, say, two weeks. And actually, they got fitter and they got on and, and your body will adapt amazingly. Um, the most I've done is about, um, well, kind of bike packing trips, about 10 days. Um, and for me, I always feel better at the end of the week than I do at the start. I'm not saying to ride through serious discomfort or things that could be potentially damaging your body, but understanding what you got yourself in for is also really important. The next question is from Matt, and he says, is it expensive to get all the necessary kit? Can it be done on a budget and still be enjoyable? I would go as far as saying, I think it's probably more enjoyable when done on a budget. And let me kind of explain myself. I think that, yes, it's nice to have the really nice kit, but I think the best part of riding bikes, especially in that kind of great outdoors sense, is um, just going out there and doing it and, and getting it done. Um, I've got some really nice kind of waterproof bags now, etc. but um, I don't think you need it. And I think actually, if you're only going out for to dip your toes and see what it's like, I think the pressure and all the kind of issues having to get everything just perfect could actually detract from the experience. I would encourage you to do some research on the internet about location, you know, get excited about it, all the places you're going to go and all the things you're going to do. But if you think, oh, what I want to do on a budget, I would just see how much stuff you can, you know, fit in a backpack and get a sweaty back. If you're only riding maybe 10 or 15 miles or something, which sounds, you know, not to be sniffed at if it's off road, is, um, yeah, just go out and enjoy it. Um, because the truth is that the really high end kit can be expensive and it's kind of you balk at it think bloody hell's teeth that's that's a lot of money but is it needed i wouldn't say so i think you can still enjoy yourself without a huge outlay um the next question is for from tasha and they say how do you plan overnight stops and this ties in with another question from rowan and he says do i have to camp in campsites or can i just camp in the yorkshire dales for example this depends kind of on region to region and country to country there's a term we call free camping and that basically means yeah just hopping over a hedge and yeah that's <laughs> wherever you lay your hat sort of thing um now that is a lot of fun i that's probably my preferred way of doing it i will just see a spot i will go somewhere to have um to have a dinner and then i know which spot i'm going to come back to i'll jump over the wherever it needs to be if i'm allowed to be there and sleep in my bivy sack um but it depends so much in what country you're in. And even like countries like New Zealand, they have really good freedom camping laws, except they start to clamp down in certain areas. So you don't want to be basically pissing off anyone or indeed getting yourself in any trouble. So if you are concerned about the overnight stop thing and you're not sure of what the rules are for you locally, I would suggest using an app called Commute, which we're really lucky to work with at GMBN. And, um, and what's cool about that is you can plan your stops on a multi-day trip and then actually it will recommend accommodation near you or accommodation along the route. Now that's going to be a really valuable resource if you live somewhere where freedom, camp freedom camping isn't an option. Um, you know, I have in the UK before, basically just <laughs> sounds a bit stupid, but ridden until like, you know, dusk and then just knocked on someone's door, exhausted after a couple hundred K riding and just been like, can I sleep on the floor? And they're just like, yeah, all right, sweet. I'll be gone at eight o'clock in the morning, which I'm not saying you want to do yourself, but I think it's always best to get permission. And um, and yeah, it just saves uh, any angry locals waking you up in the middle of the night. But that is it for this week's Ask Special about adventure biking and bike backing. I hope, I hope we hit, we got all the heavy questions, you know, the hard hitters, mainly about poo, but we, uh, we answer them all anyway. Now, thank you very much for watching and please don't forget to like and subscribe and be sure to watch out for all the great GMBN content about Adventure Week. Cheers, guys, and we'll see you next time.